No, I'm always not bad either. And, and, yeah, and when they really work. Yeah, exactly. Carolyn's is moving that way, mm -hmm. which could be a big thing. Maybe. Yeah. We're live, Madam Chair. All right. Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome. Uh, so glad to see everyone here at our quarterly board meeting. Um, and as we're getting ready to start, uh, let's begin with uh, Toya. Would you please take roll call? Yes, Madam Chair. Senator David Argel or designee Cindy Urban. Here. Governor Robert Bogle. Representative Tim Briggs. Governor William Gindelsberger. Governor Abigail Hancox. Here. Governor Derek Harshberger. Present. Katie Merritt on behalf of Governor Shapiro. Here. Governor Daniel Klingerman. Here. Vice Chair David Mazur. Here. Governor Marion Moskowitz. Here. Dr. Kate Shaw on behalf of Secretary Mumin. Here. Representative Brad Roy. Here. Senator Judah Schwank or Teresa Hoffert on behalf of the Senator. He's here. Thank you. Chair Cynthia Shapira. Here. Governor Larry Skinner. He's here. Thank you. Vice Chair Sam Smith. Here. Governor Skyla Walder. Here. Secretary Neil Weaver. Here. Governor Janet Yeomans. Here. Dr. Tina Chirelli Helminiak. Present. This completes the roll and we have a quorum, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. And now I'm going to ask everybody to please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the, to the flag, flag of the United States, States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Uh, before we start, let me uh, thank once again everybody here at the Alexander Grass campus for hosting our meeting. Uh, we always feel so comfortable here, um, like we're home, and we so appreciate you're always welcoming us back. Um, although I do have a caveat with that, given uh, the road construction, that's an extra 10 minutes it took me because I am so challenged uh, with you know directions and finding anything. Um, but but we we do love being here, and we do uh, very very much appreciate um, that uh, we are given access to this campus um, and to this wonderful room. Um, anyway, when it while it feels like we're just here, we're gathering at a time where our students, faculty, and staff are rapidly approaching the end of the academic year, which is so hard to believe, um, especially for our students. And for many, uh, that will mean walking across to uh, the start of their next lives with their commencement, be it graduate school or the next phase in their career. And this happens kind of sadly, I mean, joyfully, but sadly to be true for one of our own board members. So next month, our own Skylar Walder will graduate from Shippensburg and head off to graduate school. And uh, Skylar, we're going to um, officially recognize you uh, at our, our next board meeting, but we wanna stop here um, and ask you to say a few words. Skylar, let us, let us know what your plans are um, and also how much you will miss us. <laughs> So I'm going to start with that. <laughs> um, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, wow, it's a very full boardroom today. Of course, it's my last meeting. Um, but no, I really am very honored and privileged to be in this space and have been in this role for the last two and a half years, if I'm correct. Um, it's really been an honor to learn from all of you, um, build a lot of different relationships and really learn about our system, but also higher education as a whole. Um, I, looking back and seeing where I am today and really, um, 
I know my sophomore year self would, wouldn't see me here. So that's really cool. Um, but I applaud the board and everyone involved in this system for the work we've continued to do um, and the new work that is coming as well, because it's, you know, never stopping. Um, but I am excited, though I am sad to leave the board, um, but I will be attending Clemson University uh, to pursue a master's of education in student affairs. So I'm not leaving higher education yet, um, but I am very thankful for the experience I've been able to have here. And um, thank you for all of the work you all do for this system, but also for the Commonwealth. Skylar, I, I have to say, um, partly because you were re really able to have a, a, a good tenure uh, on the board. And so, you know, sometimes just because of where they are um, in their, their student careers, um, student governors come on the board and uh, don't have as much time uh, to really get involved and, um, you know, affect our culture and understand our culture and make the kinds of contributions that you've been able to make. Uh, and I'm very grateful for that. And I'm very, very interested in continuing, you know, to follow you and follow your career and know uh, everything that you do and to keep sending the memos because once again, here we are color coordinated every single board every meeting. time. It's unbelievable. Um, but, but seriously, you know, when we, we, we look at Skylar and Derek and, and, and Abby, uh, they embody uh, why we are here, what we're doing here. We're just so proud of them. We're, we're so inspired by them. You're our next generation of leaders and thinkers and educators and creators. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're here caretaking at this point. You're gonna lead the world um, and you're gonna lead Pennsylvania. Um, and, you know, no pressure there, but um, <laughs> but we have full faith and confidence in you, Skylar, in all of our students. Um, and, you know, sort of brings us back to our agenda because uh, today, as, as always, we keep our agenda very strategic and, and very focused on our students. And today's agenda as well sort of underscores that commitment uh, to what we are. So kind of a segue um, you know, to discussing what the agenda is, again, with all thanks to you, Skylar, and all best wishes uh, for your career. Um, but today, in addition to appointing more students to a number of councils of trustees and to the board, uh, we're also gonna recognize the academic success of our students uh, through the annual Ali Zaidi Award. We're also gonna consider some important policy changes designed to remove barriers to student success um, we are going to uh, have on our agenda the ratification of the last of our collective bargaining agreements uh, for the season, um, all of which recognize the incredibly important role of our faculty and our staff. Um, they are the ones who truly help our students succeed. And, and we thank you all so much uh, for your work uh, and for working with us to get these agreements in place so that we can all move forward. So thank you all again for being here today. Um, and engaging in these vital issues uh, as we continue uh, to move forward. Um, and with that, that concludes my remarks, short and sweet and student focused. Uh, so let's go on in our agenda to uh, provide opportunity for public comment. Randy, would you please facilitate this portion? Well, we have nobody on the phone for public comment. and I don't think there's anyone in the room for public comment. Okay. All right, well, then let's move on to our next part of our agenda to hear from our colleagues uh, who lead our statewide unions. And let me call on Dr. Ken Mash to speak on behalf of APSCA. Push the, um, Ken, push the green button there, sorry. All right, starting again. Uh, Chair Shapira, Chancellor Greenstein, governors, presidents, and gas. Uh, the last few years have been challenging ones indeed, and many of my faculty and coach colleagues have stretched themselves to the limit to survive, among other things, a pandemic. Uh, the aftermath of the, of the pandemic 
which includes something that hasn't been talked about a lot, which was dealing with students who, through no fault of their own, had to be re-socialized into college life and to learning in a college classroom. It had to make consolidation work, despite their personal perspectives on the decision to consolidate the universities. It had to adjust their teaching uh, and their coaching based on the changing needs of students. They've had adapted to new modes of teaching during this period of time. They have dealt with the continued financial squeezes that confront our universities, uh, and they have to continually figure out how to do more with less. They've had to adjust to new systems that were being implemented often on the fly. They've had to deal with circumstances mandated from above um, as administrations have tried to follow the instructions of this board. They've had to rewrite curriculum, deal with a new human resources organization, meet new fundraising goals for our coaches and respond to multiple university policy changes. And that's just the short list of the things that have gone on these last few years. They have gone through all of this while trying to help their students succeed. Chair Shapiro, Chancellor Greenstein, governors, nobody cares more about student success than my colleagues, our colleagues in other bargaining units, and all of the staff that work day to day to make sure that the system lives up to its charge to providing, of providing a high quality education at an affordable cost. Thus my coach and faculty colleagues are relieved to have new contracts and they are appreciative of the fact that these agreements go a long way towards recognizing their contributions. We are appreciative of the members of the negotiations teams that gave so much of their time, effort, thought, and patience uh, to reach uh, an agreement. And we especially appreciate the chancellor's participation uh, at the negotiation. And I'm not just saying that to be gratuitous. Uh, we do know that it is a rare thing to have a system leader who is willing to get down into the weeds uh, and to involve themselves in the work, very complex work of negotiating a faculty contract. I have said publicly uh, that we believe there is much to be proud of in these contracts. And those who read them thoroughly will see that there are changes that will reflect well in our, in our system, and I believe will actually uh, quantifiably make us national leaders in several aspects. So I wanna thank you very much for your time and we do really appreciate it, thank you. Terrific, thank you so much, Dr. Mash. We appreciate those remarks. Uh, let us now move to our consent agenda, and we're going to consider the items that are uh, listed on it, which include uh, meeting minutes and authorization to issue refunding bonds. So can I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Second. Thank you. Is there any discussion? Okay. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you. Any opposed? Okay, very good. Next, let me turn to our Student Success Committee Chair, uh, David Mazur by Zoom, who will moderate the presentation of the Ali Zaidi Award. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, Donna, um, I, I just, is the student in the room? Like I, I don't have line of sight to any of this from Zoom land. Yes. Can somebody in the room help me out here. <laughs> All right. You're good. You're good, Mr. Chair. Okay. Thank you. And everybody's in their position. All right. There you go. Created in the year 2000 by Dr. Ali Zaidi. Uh, Sadie Alizadi, who was a charter member of the Board of Governors and the State System Foundation. The Saeed R. Alizadi Award for Academic Excellence is conferred annually upon a graduating senior from one of the state system universities in recognition of outstanding academic achievement. 
Funding for this award was made possible through gifts from Dr. Ali Zaidi, Highmark, and the Pashi Foundation. The Pashi Foundation is a valuable partner in supporting and enhancing student, pers um, student persistence, completion, excellence, internships, and employment, which is perfectly aligned with the goals of this committee. It is my privilege to acknowledge Mr. Matt Steck, Vice Chair of the Pashi Foundation Board, and to invite him to the podium to now say a few words. Matt, good to see you virtually. Thank you, David. Good to see you. It's an honor to be here this morning on behalf of the Pashi Foundation. I'm Matt Steck, Vice Chairman of the Board of the Foundation, and also proudly serve on the Shippensburg Council of Trustees. The foundation raises funds and builds corporate partnerships to increase student affordability, ensure student success, and support university excellence. Over the past years, we've directly supported students with scholarships and emergency grants, funded workforce development, pilots at our universities, and secured sponsorship to bring the PASHI community together for the Student Startup Challenge and DEI Summit. We've also supported strategic innovations in collaboration with the Chancellor's Office. We are a foundation that works with and for all 10 of the PASHI universities. I've served for over a decade on the foundation board and our corporate and individual sponsors continue to make a difference in the lives of students across our campuses. And I thank them as well. We realize firsthand the need to attract and retain talent in the Commonwealth's workforce. And this year, look forward to launching a work-based learning initiative to expand our students' access to meaningful internships and to strengthen PASHI's contribution to the Commonwealth's talent pool. Regardless of your politics, the honoree here this morning is proof that students at our 10 universities are eager and willing to work hard to achieve academic success given the opportunity. And I'm proud to be here on behalf of the Pashi Foundation to celebrate her achievements. Thank you, Matt. 10 students were nominated by their universities for the 2024 Ali Zaidi Award. Each represents the best of the talent, motivation, and remarkable accomplishments of our students. In recognition of their achievements, each of the other nine finalists will receive a certificate signed by the chancellor and myself, as well as a $50 award from the foundation. I would now like to invite President Aaron Walton, Cheney University, to come to the podium to introduce our 2024 Ali Zaidi Award winner. President Walton. Thank you, Governor Major, and good morning, everyone. Uh, this brings back a lot of memories for me because I was on the board when Ali Zaidi was alive and was a participant in funding the Ali Zaidi Award, never knowing that I would be here this morning, this time, presenting it to one of our own students. As you are aware, there are many academically talented students in the state system and at Cheney, but there are those who stand above the others. At Cheney, our vision is to become the premier educational model of excellence in academics, character, and social responsibility. Our awardee this morning demonstrates the vision that Cheney has. Not only has she accomplished academically, but her social behavior and her contributions are far, go far beyond a student of today's ilk. And I'm so proud to be able to present her this award because we've had many conversations over the years about her career and her trajectory. There's no question in my mind she will have a major impact on this society. And I'm proud that she is here representing Cheney University as the first student at Cheney to get the Ali Zaidi Award. So I present to you Raked Suleiman. Am I doing the actual physical presentation? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, we're doing this half on Zoom and, and, and half, half in person. It's hard, it's hard to physically present virtually. <laughs> <laughs> Here you go. It's, um, it's, it's beautiful and you're beautiful and Thank we're so you. proud of you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Do you like to say a few words? Um, <laughs> you don't have to. If, is that not scripted? I don't have the script for this. Oh, no. I um, good, evening, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, I want to say thank you so much to the board. Um, it is truly an honor to be not only nominated, but chosen for this award. I'm truly 
truly very appreciative and short of words. Um, but thank you so much. Thank you. And we'll just do one more quick one more one more presentation um, to you. This is a resolution from the House of Representatives of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, recognizing your accomplishments. I'm going to hand that to you. And this is a resolution from the Senate of Pennsylvania, congratulating you and recognizing your accomplishments. We are so tremendously proud of everything you have. I've got to make one more comment. This goes real deep because her sister is a Cheney graduate. Our valedictorian is now in medical school. Nice. And for those on Zoom, we'll just pause for a moment while we take a photo. Please smile. We uh, thank you very much. That was wonderful. Absolutely beautiful. What an incredible family, by the way. Um, uh, we are going to uh, actually hear uh, remarks um, from Rich Furrix on behalf of ACT. I see you on Zoom. Please go <laughs> ahead. <laughs> thank you very much, Madam Chair, and, and thank you for the opportunity to join you virtually. Uh, one of the nonprofit boards I serve on is having an important meeting later this morning, and I did not want to miss it. Before I start with my remarks, congratulations to the Alex Zadie uh, Award winner. Uh, you really exemplify what the Commonwealth universities are all about. Our state system is doing a wonderful job. So thank you very, very much for representing us. Now, as I've said at the beginning of most of my presentations to the board, the main focus of my remarks is to keep the Board of Governors aware of what PACT is doing to engage our trustees. So let me begin with our annual conference that was coordinated by our vice president, Mark Bellini from Penn West University. It was held virtually on April the 3rd. And we began our meeting with remarks from our chancellor that updated us on the state system's effort to advance affordability, student success, and alignment with the workforce needs of the state. Thank you very much, Dan, for joining us. We certainly appreciated your remarks. The trustees then engaged in a discussion with the American Council of Trustees and Alumni, ACTA, on the role of trusteeship as state system trustees that is quite different from the role of trustees at a private or a state-related university. ACTA emphasized the responsibility of trustees to be experts of their own universities as they supported the role of the system. Good news from a budget lens, was reported by our treasurer, Karen Russell from Commonwealth University. Because of our ability to hold most of our meetings virtually, PACT will again be able to operate without charging dues for the 24-25 academic year. President, you are welcome. We also, <laughs> recognized, we also recognized our outgoing members of the PACT Executive Committee for their service, Mike Ross from Shippensburg University, Jack Wabi from Kutztown University, and Melissa Bauer from Clarion University. During the meeting, trustees elected their officers for the 24-25 term. First vice president was Betty Silva from Westchester University. Our second vice president was Mark Bellini from Penn West University. Our secretary was Thomas Grayuski from East Stroudsburg University. And our treasurer continues to be Karen Russell from Commonwealth University. I was honored to continue as the president of PACT. Finally, PACT was pleased to be invited to participate in the advisory group focusing on the governor's statewide blueprint for higher education. Their, their initial meeting will be held later today, and we are anxious to hear what will be said. Thank you, Madam Chair. That concludes my report. 
Thank you very much, Rich. Um, we appreciate those remarks. Um, we are now going to move into committee sessions. Um, just a reminder, while all only committee members uh, used to be the chancellor's remarks. Oh, I'm so sorry. I did do that, didn't I? Okay, forget that. We are going to the chancellor's remarks. Dan? My board chair is subtly sending me a message. <laughs> She's heard enough from me. <laughs> I guess I have as well. Let me spend uh, uh, just a few moments tying together a theme that's running uh, through today's meeting. It's a theme of investment in the state system. And it's students, it's people, and our continued significant progress in service to our owner's state. And the key point, because I've been told sometimes I wait to the end to deliver it, is our universities are the best vehicle in Pennsylvania to deliver on the state's most urgent needs, building the talent, talented workforce that Pennsylvania needs to remain competitive, producing more degrees, focusing in the highest need areas, teaching healthcare, business, et cetera, STEM, IT, and making higher education affordable and accessible to all students, not just some ensuring that colleges and universities are great stewards of and accountable and transparent for the taxpayer and student dollars that they spend and that, they're, that they are willing and able and ready to evolve and transform to remain relevant, vital, fresh, and responsive to the ever-changing needs of our students, our communities, and our employees and employers. Those needs have been discussed for several years now and energy is now coalescing around them thanks to the leadership of Governor Shapiro and members of the General Assembly, both chambers, both parties. And so you know, these state system universities, our universities, we are hands down the best vehicle in this state to deliver on those needs. We offer the most career aligned, career relevant quality education in programs that are in the highest demand at the lowest cost to taxpayers and students, full stop. You add up the dollars that are spent by taxpayers and students, and you divide by the number of degrees, and we offer the lowest marginal cost for each new degree to taxpayers and students in the state. Hands down, no question, not even close. Today, we'll hear about investment in two forms. Investment from the state, from which we are asking an additional $38 million to meet our normal inflationary costs. Actually, it's abnormal inflationary costs. $38 million incremental adjustment in our budget is 1.9%, 2.3% of our um, uh, uh, education in general budget. 2.3% is significantly below the rate of inflation, which testifies to our stewardship. And we are talking about investment in our people when we ask the board later to ratify three collective bargaining agreements. Both are vital. Investments from the state will allow the board to freeze student tuition for an unprecedented sixth year, driving affordability harder, improving enrollment, retention, and credential completion as it has done demonstrably over the past few years. An investment in our people, to Dr. Mash's point, allows us to reward and acknowledge and look after our employees, to recognize their hard work over these past several difficult years to acknowledge that their roles are changing often rapidly and to appreciate everything they do to change with them. It is an opportunity to recognize that ours is a people business and our people, our employees, they are responsible for the successes that we have logged and we have logged plenty. So I'm going to turn to a few because I can't help myself. So we're here for our students. And we do everything we can to support their success into and through universities and into great careers. And we're good at what we do. After a dozen years of losses, we have seen first-time student enrollments grow two years in a row, thanks in large part to the board's courage in freezing tuition for five successive years and the state's willingness to support us in doing this. A majority of our students, more than two-thirds, are in programs of study that lead directly to careers in the highest demand. Our students graduate, they get good jobs, they earn good salaries, they stay in Pennsylvania. We're a powerful engine of social mobility. Students who enroll from low-income households are earning about as much as those who enroll from high-income households 10 years after graduation. And our focus on improving our students' success is paying off. 
Four-year graduation rates continue to grow over a decade. Our year-on-year -year retention rates are at historic highs. We're beginning to see movement in reduction of attainment gaps that exist between lower and higher income students and between white, black, and brown students. And some of the chaos and discord that is routinely reported from many colleges and universities across this country, it is not happening at our university. We work closely with employers to help them source the talent they need to succeed in Pennsylvania and to connect our students to great careers. We work with employers in developing and revising our programs. We have a growing number of work-based learning opportunities, means internships, and we do bespoke training so that employers can upskill and reskill their current employees. We have partnerships at state level with major employers. We announced one recently with Heimer, with Google, with the Commonwealth, and with others. And we have many, many more at the university level with school districts, manufacturing, engineering firms, technology companies, to name but a few. On a recent visit to Millersville, I got to tour several departments, meteorology, robotics, biology, to name but a few. And in every department, we were presented with the faculty and the students and the employers who are working closely with those departments to build career pipelines into roles in Pennsylvania. And I was on that visit with a couple of people who don't often get or don't often as I get to visit our universities. And I was able to see the look on their faces as they watched what was going on, which could have happened at any one of our 10 universities on our 14 campuses, to realize the recognition that we're not any longer what people think of as yesterday's teachers colleges. We are vital, entrepreneurial, dynamic, and we are open for business. With respect to our universities in 2018, several of them were in difficult financial straits. Today, we still have challenges, but we also have viable pathways through them. And our financial health indicators that have been declining or that were declining uh, through 2019 are all leveling. Or turning upwards. And our system is achieving measurable goals that we designed it to accomplish back in the day under guidance of this board. How do I know? Our shared service efficiencies are at 320 million since 2019. They have played a critical role in our ability to freeze students' tuition in advance of receiving re more recently the state support that we have received. We have developed and are beginning to use an infrastructure that we only imagined in 2019 that enables students at any of our universities to take advantage of programs at all of our universities. And because we have worked collaboratively to scale the pace and impact of student-centered innovation and employee debt professional development in critical areas, financial sustainable budgeting, academic program management, and we're moving into enrollment management, financial aid optimization for our students, and into student-facing practices, including health and wellness. Our universities are working together with healthcare providers to see how, by working together, they can produce more need nurses in response to the state's urgent needs. They're working together with the Department of Education and others to improve the flow and production of teachers. And Indiana University is initiating conversations about a college of osteopathic medicine. And while it's an Indiana University venture, it is envisaged as one that creates opportunities for prospective osteopathic doctors, pre-med students across our system. This is a new kind of system, a different kind of work, evidence of our willingness to evolve and grow in service to the state. One more proof point. Like any executive, I have a cabinet, presidents, they are close partners in designing and implementing our system's redesign strategies. And I have an extended management team, which includes university leadership, chief academic officers, chief financial officers, chief information officers, and a new faculty council with representation uh, liaison on the board of governors, a council that did not exist only a few years ago. And I'm told reliably that our, that our chief academic officers and our faculty councils met just the other day to reimagine and think about ways that we could work together to move our system forward programmatically in service to the state. That in and of itself is a profoundly important event. And as evidence of its impact, soon after the meeting took place, the earth moved, <laughs> literally. And a total solar eclipse happened. That's a lot. So at the bottom, let me return to the top. These state-owned universities, our universities, 
we are hands down the best vehicle in this state to deliver on the state's most urgent needs. We offer the most affordable, career-aligned, career-relevant education in programs in the highest demand at the lowest cost to taxpayers and students, full stop. Ours is the lowest marginal cost for each new degree to taxpayers and students in the state, hands down, no question, not even close. Today, we'll hear about two investments. Investments from the state from which we have asked an additional 38 million, 2.3% of our norm to cover our inflationary costs so we don't have to put that burden on our students. And we'll speak about investment in our people. In my view, and according to the data that I see, we, in effect, have created the investment perspective or prospectus, I think, that the board suggested that we begin to build back in 2018 and 19 so that we can go to the people of Pennsylvania and to our students, not just to ask for support, but to promise and deliver on the promise that for that support, we will deliver for the state what the state most urgently needs. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, those are very impactful and very timely uh, remarks. And uh, I think the board uh, completely supports you and joins you um, in uh, everything that you said about our partnership uh, with the faculty, uh, with our staff, uh, all of it um, for our students and student success. Um, I think we all realize that uh, challenges remain, uh, but there's just a feeling that we've turned a corner, just a real feeling uh, that we're in a different place. And I would, I would just add to that, um, and I've said this before, but I'll say it again because it continues, the national recognition um, and the, the national attention uh, that we're getting. Dan and I we're on a panel together at the recent uh, Association of Governing Boards of Colleges and Universities, their national meeting, um, talking about how to prevent failed presidencies, which, which was interesting. But our theme was uh, about partnership. Uh, when there's a partnership between the board um, and the executive uh, and uh, the staff and the, and the faculty, et cetera, uh, then presidents don't fail. And, and I, I think that's important. Um, and, and I was on two other panels because this meeting with 1,200 uh, trustees from all over the country and, and college presidents and university presidents, they're still interested in hearing about our integrations, our university integrations. How did we do it? And this is like the second or third year in a row. Um, you know, we, we've talked about that at various meetings. So, um, uh, you know this this formula. This formula is working, and it's it's because of all of you. Um, so, just you know, off the top of my head, I just want to say that, Dan. Thank you very much. And now we'll move into committee sessions. So, <laughs> um, so again, uh, as we're in committee sessions, we encourage uh, members of the board um, to uh, to ask questions um, and, and to engage when it comes to vote, voting on actions to be recommended out of these our, our committees to the board for full vote. Only committee members are uh, supposed to be voting, um, but we do use this opportunity for robust discussion. We are going to begin with the Student Success Committee. Um, can I call on Chairman uh, David Mazur to moderate? by Zoom. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, is Donna uh, at the podium or wherever she can be to at her uh, mic, guide yes. us? She's ready. Okay. I'm ready. Uh, Donna, then, if you would be so kind as to uh, walk everyone through, we have uh, two different motion action items. We're going to take them. We're going to review them one at a time and then we will vote on them together. So review, question, review, question, vote. And with that as background, Donna, if you wouldn't mind taking us through the first policy item. Sure, thank you, Chairman Mazur. The first policy uh, coming for your consideration is policy 1990-06A, academic degrees. This policy establishes broad educational policy governing academic degrees. 
uh, the policy includes a number of stipulations about several components of the degree. The proposed revision adds stipulations about developmental education in math and English composition. Specifically, the proposed revision terminates prerequisite developmental education and requires that all developmental education in the state system be conducted as co-requisite student supports. The policy revision further requires universities to make progress implementing evidence-based developmental education reforms associated with student supports. This evidence-based reform of developmental education will bring PASHI into alignment with over a decade of rigorous research and with several other states and systems who have implemented similar policy or legislative reforms. I included more information about developmental education and the co-requisite delivery of developmental education in the rationale for the policy change. So I won't rehearse all of that here, but I'm happy to take any questions or observations that you might have. And there are no hands in the room, Mr. Chairman, and no hands. No hands on Zoom. Okay. Thank you, Donna. Okay. Then we move on to the second policy that's uh, before you for consideration, and um, that is Policy 1986-04A Program Review. The purpose of individual program review is to assure quality through a culture of assessment and continuous improvement and to inform planning and decision making. Five year review of academic programs is required by the Pennsylvania Code and it supports the middle states institutional accreditation process. The proposed revisions result from a collaborative process to establish program standards that all universities will be expected to use, which are set out in an associated procedure and standard. The revised policy emphasizes quality assurance for individual programs and provides a transparent link between student and workforce demand for the individual program and the financial sustainability of the program array, that is the entire portfolio of academic programs, as is reported in the comprehensive planning process. The proposed revisions also add a feedback loop to the department. So I'm also happy to take questions or observations on this policy revision. Any questions? Mm. There's a uh, just Chairman Smith. Just kind of out of curiosity, um, I don't know, maybe Chancellor can answer this. Um, we talked yesterday a little bit about what IUP has been doing in terms of their, you know, kind of program review. Is this the same kind of thing that we would have just gone through, for maybe for different reasons or something? But uh, is, that, is it the same thing? Yeah, correct. And um, it's something that is 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 um, programs are never static needs change, knowledge evolves. And, um, and so it's, it's, it's a process uh, uh, that our uh, chief academic officers have worked very closely on uh, and in, in, in consultation, obviously, uh, with faculty to, con to, to continue to evolve in ways that meet our, our, our needs to ensure that what we're doing for our students is, is fresh and current and, and what are still. So, so this puts in place a kind of framework within which universities can pursue their own um, uh, uh, continuous program review. So in the, in the past, we have not required or heavily suggested that schools do a program review to see if it's really worth doing, still offering Celtic poetry? poetry. So um, in the past, I'll, I'm gonna tag team with Donna. So we have, we have been in evolving form. So we have had very, um, lockstep prescriptive, I think, approaches um, to, to review. And I think what we're learning 
in this evolution of a new system and, and where we started four or five years ago, the purpose of this system was to recognize that you can't easily manage our universities from Harrisburg, that program management isn't something you can do from the top, right? And that the, that, that the presidents and their faculty and their colleagues are much better positioned to understand the needs of their students, the needs of their employees, the needs of their markets in which they operate, and that we have in, engineered a circumstance where they can work together in, in, in developing their programs, but to be very responsive to those needs. And so we've changed, we've evolved a framework I mean, it really is a framework which provides high-level guidance, which is what you're seeing here, uh, within which universities can operate, but operate in ways which make sense within their own institutions. And I, um, any of our presidents can chime in if they like. One last question. Then is incorporated in that, what this policy would do, does it also at least uh, open the door to thinking about what we might be doing at school A that we really should just be using what school B is offering and take advantage of that element of systemness. So to me, this is one of, and it's hard to express and, you know, remark, this is one of, I think, our, my colleagues, and when I say colleagues, that extended group that I talked about, I think it's one of their most important successes is that the, the, the energy, the thrust we, for strategic investment in academic programs comes through the kind of dialogue that results, that is that is actually um, um, uh, encouraged, that required almost through the policy environment that we're establishing. So, and I'll give you a, a concrete example because we heard about it. Um, uh, Indiana University of Pennsylvania, uh, the provost there is uh, having a conversation which will happen in another month or so with uh, other uh, chief academic officers. Conversations are beginning to happen about, here are programs that we really need to or want to offer for our students but we're not confident that we have the 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 the, the resources, the material, the, the the demand, the, the the expertise to to offer them on ourselves. We we don't have enough Celtic poets or students interested in Celtic, which is shocking to me because um, to to stand up like a great school of Celtic poetry at University A. But working together, we can really do a kick-ass school of Celtic poetry, which would probably be world class, frankly. And and so. And those conversations are growing out of that structure, out of the universities coming through our, our faculty council is engaged in a, um, you know, we're all trying to figure out how to use this infrastructure that we built, which allows us to do these. It's, it's, it's a technology infrastructure, but it's also a governance infrastructure. And we're all using it to figure out precisely where those strategic investments might, um, might make most sense. And what's so interesting to me is that you know, it probably takes a little longer, just saying, because there's a lot of talking that needs to go on in consultation, but it's stickier. It's, it, it grows organically and it, it's, because it grows organically, it is genuinely responsive to real local felt demand. So, um, you know, it's, and it's, it's a work in progress, but you know, then, then it, it puts us, my colleague Natalie and her team uh, and others in the, in how do we provide the tools and resources, the data, the insights, the intel that enables that planning, that kind of careful conversation between our provosts. So I think you're beginning to see the fruits of those labors. This is a kind of policy reflection of it, but as excitingly to me is some of the demonstrable evidence that people are now beginning to use these tools and processes to think in a more, I don't want to say, I don't know if coordinated is the wrong word, strategic, I think, uh, uh, way about how to provide the programs that the state needs, um, you know, in, 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 a, in a collaborative. Thank you. Did Any you have questions? Yeah, that's it. Okay. Um, I, I just would add to Governor Smith's direct question. This policy was in development with the CAOs while Provost Lukahans was working and developing locally are so there's a good overlap and some good experience, I think, that informed the discussion. The second thing I would just add, also the process for us identified some programs where we think we have something to offer to the rest of the system, just like we may need more Celtic poetry faculty to serve students and build a stronger program. So I think it works both ways, and I think it's a great discussion, a great test case that moves to much more impactful, that's the word I would use in addition to strategic program reviews than we've seen in the system in the past. And uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Dr. Cyril Hemenyuk has a point. 
In response sure. also, I would say that faculty are committed to working together like never before in the system. And so we are seeing movement where faculty in collaboration with the chief academic officers are coming together for the first time in our system's history to talk about where we can support one another. And it's interesting to have been part of this system both um, at Shippensburg as a student and an adjunct and now at Westchester just to realize how truly siloed we have been through the history of our system. And we're trying to actively take down those silos, not just internally at our universities, but across the system. How can we support one another? And part of that is because of the solidarity that has not only been previous, but strengthened through the consolidation and the pandemic of how can we support one another? Because we know that we are all being asked to do more that with less, but we want to do it in a way in which not only helps us to survive as individual workers, but also to support our student success. And so there will be a upcoming meeting for the first time where all of the historians are coming together. And there's another um, meeting that's going to be with the geoenvironmental sciences faculty coming together. And so this is this is new and this is um, exciting, I think, from a faculty perspective. Mr. Chair, I see no more hands in the room or on Zoom. Thank you. And before we actually get to the motion, uh, could Toya do a, a roll call vote for the committee? Yes, committee chair. Chair Governor David Mazur. Here. Vice Chair Governor Marion Moskowitz. She's Here. Online. Senator David Argo or his designee, Cindy Urban. Here. Representative Tim Briggs. Dr. Kate Shaw on behalf of Secretary Mumin. Here. Governor Larry Skinner. Here. Yeah. Cynthia Shapira. Here. And President Bashar Hanna. Here. This completes the roll. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, so unless there is any more discussion, I would like to introduce the motion that the board approve revisions to policy 1990-06-A, yeah. academic degrees, as shown in the board materials and policy 1986-04-A program review as shown in the board materials. Do I have a second? I'll second that. Thank you, Marion. Any further discussion? No hands in the room, no hands online. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none and assuming there are none in the room, motion carries. Thank you all with that. It concludes the meeting of this committee and I will hand the virtual gavel back over to Chair Shapiro. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Mazur. I appreciate that. Uh, before we move on to the Governance and Leadership Committee, um, Dan, I think that uh, uh, you had want, wanted to make another uh some other remarks relevant to student success? Yeah, thanks, um, uh, Cindy. I just wanted to return, as I promised, to the investment theme, and, and we just have a, a couple of slides. Um, uh, so as you know, we have a, a, a budget uh, appropriations request of $38 million, uh, I mentioned before, uh, representing about 2.3% of our uh, total education and general expenditure. Uh, obviously, those are the costs that allow us to freeze tuition for our students. Um, they are genuine inflationary costs. So I just want to provide a little context. And, and obviously, we're not having, we're not taking a tuition action. We're not bringing a tuition recommendation forward. But those costs are real. And, and so I want to just contextualize, you know, where we, you know, what, what will happen if, um, uh, you know, and, and, and obviously, we are so intent on working closely as ever with our partners in the state um, to, to uh, ensure our students have a, a, a tuition freeze. And to generate that investment. But let me just provide some context so you have it. Um, and we'll obviously revisit this topic in um, in, in uh, July if we need to. So um, uh, Randy, if you go directly to slide 36 or seven, your choice. Uh, the, the, go back to the, the, 30, the inflationary line. 
one more. Back. Yeah, there we go. So there's the historical trend of uh, tuition um, that you see on the, uh, and obviously it's um, uh, uh, several years of, uh, of a tuition freeze. Um, I, I, I can't do the math in the top, off the top of my head on the rate of inflation, the applied rate of inflation over those uh, years, but I have a feeling it was not zero. Um, and, uh, you know, so, so I just want to, uh, we need to understand, and, and the first couple of years of those tuition freezes were, um, uh, you know, generated internally um, so that we could demonstrate our, our capacity. So that's, that's what we're trying to accomplish. And, and of course, if you go to the next slide, what you see is that, you know, price really matters to students when, when you know, when, when, when we become relatively more affordable, as we have been, uh, compared to other options, guess what happens? Those are our first-time student enrollment trends. Uh, we've seen two years of increases in first-time student, first-time undergraduate student enrollments. Um, so, you know, everything that we're talking about is sort of in the, in the, in the, in, at the state level and about higher education generally, affordability really matters, demonstrable evidence here. There's others which I won't bore you with. It matters in terms of student retention. Our retention goes up when people can pay the bills. Funny that. Um, and they see the value of, of a college or a university degree because of the connection to the workforce. So, so that's what we're trying to accomplish. And then if you go just quickly to slide 39, uh, you know, that the $38 million is real. It represents, again, it's 2.3% increase in our education and general uh, fund budget, which is substantially below the prevailing rate of inflation. So it testifies to our ability to act as good stewards and curtail our costs, right? So, um, but that is the genuine cost of keeping our, our student tuition, uh, that is the uh, keeping our doors open and keeping the level of operation um, uh, and uh, quality performance that we're beginning to see. So that it's just a table which gives a sense of, you know, other ways to get to that 38 million and, um, you know, which is the number that we need to operate. Uh, and so um, obviously uh, I just wanted to have that there as context and we'll make sure that you have it. It, it shows you for every 1% um, student tuition increase, the revenue that's generated uh, demonstrates uh, that a 6.5% increase from the state, $38 million, is about equivalent to a 45, a 4.5% increase in our students. So some combination, through some combination, we're going to have to figure out how to get to the uh, to the $38 million. And again, uh, I'm just so optimistic and grateful for the great partnership we've had with the, the state over these past years, which have enabled us not just to talk about affordability, but to, to walk to, 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 to walk the walk and demonstrate that price really matters and students do better when we are atten attentive to their needs. I just wanted to provide that as context. And then that's my... Any questions, obviously. Right. Any question or comment from that? Okay. All right. Let's uh, move on with our uh, committees. I'm now going to call on uh, Vice Chair and Chairman of the Governance and Leadership Committee, Sam Smith, to moderate this portion. All right. Thank you, Chair Shapira. Uh, Toya, would you please take the roll call for the Governance and Leadership Committee? Yes, Committee Chair. Here. Governor David Mazur. Here. Thank you. Governor Abigail Hancock. Here. Senator Judith Schwank or her designee, Teresa Hoffert. Cynthia Shapira. Here. And Teresa is here. Thank you. And President Kenneth Long. This completes the roll call. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this morning we have um, two actions for this committee to consider, which will then be brought before the full board later in the meeting uh, this morning. Um, one of those items is appointment of student trustees for a number of universities. The second item is the appointment of a student board member for uh, the Board of Governors. Uh, so, as we all know, uh, providing that student voice on on our uh, on our councils of trustees is, is a really important role and the process now uh, is streamlined. And I think we actually have a better system for developing and getting these students um, you know, off the list of wanting to be and actually on the councils of trustees. So with our students on our councils, we can ensure that they always have access to students' perspective when making decisions, just like they do for our student board members on the Board of Governors does here. Well, we want that same thing at the council of trustees level. Uh, the universities have developed a, a really good process for recruiting uh, uh, and proposing to identify uh, 
and vet potential candidates in order to make recommendations for these appointments. And then uh, the agenda packet is information regarding the student trustees candidates that we will consider today. Um, to begin uh, to introduce these students, I would like to first recognize President Wubla from Millersville University to uh, give us a little introduction to your candidate, Bridget Lowe. I'm pleased to um, recommend um, Bridget. Bridget actually um, is the roommate of the outgoing um, student trustee. <laughs> and so um, they've been working together and Bridget um, also, she had a choice of either being the SGA president or serving as a student trustee. And she chose to be uh, the student trustee. We are looking forward to a lot of uh, good contribution towards our uh, Council of Trustees. Thank you, President Wuba. I'll now turn to President Bernatowski to give us a little introduction to Tyreek Whitson from Penn West. Thank you. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Tyreek Whitson, our nominee for Penn West California's next student trustee. Tyreek, a sophomore, dual majoring in sociology and political science, possesses an impressive academic background coupled with extensive campus engagement. Serving as a student government senator and Rainbow Alliance treasurer, Tyreek is dedicated to student governance. Additionally, his participation in the Student Association Incorporated and the Penn West Leadership Academy further highlights his commitment to serving our institution. Tyreek also exemplifies a strong spirit of community service. He generously volunteers his time with organizations such as Charlie Batch's Batch of Toys, the Special Olympics Pittsburgh Polar Plunge, and the Greater Pittsburgh Food Bank. In consideration of Tyreek's demonstrated leadership, academic excellence, and community involvement, I am confident that he will excel in representing the student body of Penn West California. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Shippensburg is also uh, one of the schools that will be appointing a student trustee for their council or a student to their council of trustees. And I'll ask President Patterson to introduce Colin Arnold. Thank you, Governor Smith, members of the Governance and Leadership Committee and colleagues. I'm honored uh, to endorse Colin Arnold as the nominee for student trustee on the Shippensburg University Council of Trustees. Colin is a dedicated member of our campus community and prides himself in serving others. In high school, Colin volunteered his time raising money for wounded veterans, served on various projects at his local church, and pitched in on the family farm. At SHIP, he's an academic standout as a history major with minors in political science and military science. He's a recipient of the National Army ROTC Scholarship and throughout the university's ROTC program, hopes to serve in the United States Army upon graduation. As a cadet, Colin is a member of the Ranger Challenge Team and serves with the Raider Battalion Color Guard and Cannon Crew. He's also an active part of our Student Government Association as part of the Constitution Review Committee and serves with Catholic Campus Ministry. Service is what drives Colin Arnold, and I'm confident in his abilities to serve as the Shippensburg University member of the Council of Trustees. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, President Riley, would you please introduce Char Charlie Servo, Savro, excuse me, from Slippery Rock. Apologize for that. Yeah, no worries. Good morning, it's my pleasure to introduce Carly Severo as Slippery Rock University's nominee for student trustee. Carly is a second semester sophomore from Albion, PA. She is pursuing a Bachelor of Arts degree majoring in political science with a concentration in law and politics. Carly is an excellent student with a perfect 4.0 GPA. In addition to her impressive academic record and classwork leadership, she is actively engaged in numerous leadership positions on campus. She is president of the Debate Society, president of the Law Society, a first seminar peer leader, and a former vice president of House Council. Carly is a recipient of the Peter J. Osterling Scholarship awarded to outstanding political science majors and in pre-law advisement program. She has received Dean's List status every semester at SRU. Carly earns high praise from her professors as a mature and responsible student with excellent critical thinking skills 
and a keen perceptive approach to her work. She is actively taking every opportunity to enrich her college experience as in, and is engaged with numerous student organizations on campus. She's eager to serve as the student trustee on the council and partner with the campus community to move our institution forward. I believe she, she will do so with poise, confidence, and discretion. <clears throat> I enthusi enthusiastically recommend Carly Severo for the student trustee position at Slippery Rock University and believe she will serve the students in the campus community very well. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, President Riley. Our fifth uh, student uh, nominee for council trustees is at Westchester, and I'll ask President Forentino to uh, introduce Chris Needham. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm pleased to introduce Westchester University's nominee for our next student trustee, Christopher Needham. Chris is a second year biomedical engineering major uh, in our pre-med track. He's graduating in 2026, so we'll have him for a couple of years. Uh, I won't reveal his grade point average, but apparently somebody gave him an A minus. <laughs> Uh, Chris is a member of the Honors College, which has taught him the importance of focusing on social change and making a difference in the world. Chris volunteers in the Honor College Peer Leadership Program, in which he mentors fellow biomedical engineering majors and helps set them on paths to success. Chris is always eager to speak about his life-changing trip to South Africa, which he took through the Honors College, where he studied apartheid, social change, and South African culture and history. I encourage anyone who meets Chris to ask him about that trip and you will see a glimpse of his passion and enthusiasm that he brings that he will bring to our Council of Trustees. Chris has been a tutor with the Learning Assistance and Resource Center. In fact, he tutors calculus. On the Council of Trustees, Chris's goal is to be a bridge between the student body and the council, and he recognizes the importance of representing the diversity of all student experiences at Westchester. I will end by simply stating the obvious. Christopher Needham is an outstanding student with a strong understanding of the student trustee role and how he can most effectively serve both his fellow students and the university. He demonstrated the ability to form fast connections with students, faculty, and administrators alike through his strong communication and interpersonal skills. He's a sincere, passionate, and engaging student who I believe will connect with other COT members and get to work. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, President Forentino. Just as a... Uh, Point of information, there is additional information uh, from each of these candidates. I know we all have plenty of stuff to read, and sometimes these packets uh, can be a little daunting, but I do encourage people, members, uh, to, to at least skim through these uh, summaries of these students. They're kind of their application of letters they've written to support their interest in it. They're, they're pretty, pretty amazing uh, sub stories that go on there, but I want to just kind of point that out to you. At this point, I would ask for a motion from a member of the committee that uh, we recommend to the board appoint these five students as listed in item 10A of the board materials. May I have a motion? So moved. Thank you, Chair Shapira, and seconded by Vice Chair Mazur. Any other discussion from the committee or members of the board? No. Members of the committee, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the recommendation will move to the full board. Randy, do you have anybody, any of yes. these students available? Yes, Mr. Chair. Uh, most are in class at this moment, but we are lucky to have a couple. Um, first, we'll start with Tyreek and then Colin. Tyreek? Hello, everyone on the board of governors. Um, first, I want to like to say thank you for this opportunity. I am really excited to get to work. Um, I've been involved in leadership opportunities since I've came to Cal and I can't wait to be on the um, the trustees board and be able to get to work and represent all my peers. Um, yeah, I'm really excited. Thank you, Tyreek. And for those who aren't Pittsburgh fans, we'll forgive the thing in the background. Um, <laughs> Next, we'll go to Colin. Distinguished members of the PASHI Board of Governors, uh, thank you for inviting me for this awesome occasion and for approving my nomination to be the next student trustee for Shippensburg University. 
truly has been a honor and a humbling experience to be selected as the next student trustee. And I also wanna thank the Shippensburg Council of Trustees for selecting me and President Patterson for those endorse endorsement remarks. And as a third generation Shippensburg University student, I take great pride in being a part of this amazing campus and continuing the personal legacy of my family. And I'm very excited to work with the Council of Trustees, the SHIP administration, and my fellow students to continue to make SHIP an amazing place and to keep the SHIP sailing forward. As a member of the prestigious Shippensburg ROTC Raider Battalion, I would like to end with its famous motto that continues to drive Shippensburg cadets and students. Raiders lead the way and Shippensburg University will continue to lead the way within the PASHE system across the great state of Pennsylvania and across this great country. Thank you again for this awesome opportunity. Andy? That is it, madam. That is it, Mr. Chair. All right. Well, thank you. Glad that we had a couple of students available. Um, we certainly appreciate uh, their willingness to serve on our councils of trustees. Um, we will now turn to our second uh, order of business for this committee today, and that is the student board member appointment to the Board of Governors. As Chair Shapira noted earlier today, Governor Schuyler Walter will be rotating off the uh, board when she graduates next month. And not that we're giving her the bums rush and replacing her before she leaves. What? <laughs> But, <laughs> but, you know, but Randy thought it was really a nice little feather in someone's hat if we were to have the new board member ready to roll in our in our early July or July meeting. So we're not giving you the rush. You know that, Sky. Um, seriously, um, uh, so the committee is, we are trying to be aggressive about it, though, just because we want these students to be here. We, we want the student board members and why miss an opportunity to get them on on the board as soon as we can? So we we appreciate what you. Uh, anyways, so the committee is bringing forward uh, its recommendation for the student appointee to fill this seat and to begin that process. We invited one one nomination from each university pre president. Uh, let me say that we continue to receive amazing candidates for these roles, and I'm so impressed with all the nominees. After reviewing the nominees and conducting interviews, the Governance and Leadership Committee recommends Ali Sinu, Sinu Sharifi from Shippensburg to fill the seat that would be vacated when Governor Walter graduates. Sina is a remarkable person that will bring a great deal of insights to the board, and I would ask President Patterson to please give us a more detailed introduction of Sina. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm honored to be before you today and endorse Shippensburg University student Sina Sharifi as nominee for Pennsylvania State System of Higher Education's Board of Governors. Member of the Woods Honors College, Sina is a political science major who is very active in our campus community. He serves as a member of our Student Government Association, is a residence assistant in our residence halls, and is a student delegate to our university forum. This past summer, he served in an internship with the U.S. Army War College in Carlisle a prestigious accomplishment for a student only in his second year. Sina is a standout student on our campus. He's a true leader and advocate for his peers, but there is much more to Sina's story, which has inspired him to take an active role in shaping higher education. Sina was born and raised in Afghanistan, but after the Taliban took over Kabul in 2021, at the age of 17, he and his younger sister were forced to escape together, leaving behind their younger brother and parents. Sina and his sister spent months in refugee camps in Qatar and eventually came to New Jersey and then Pennsylvania. Two days after arriving in Pennsylvania, Sina enrolled at Shippensburg University, and as I stated earlier, continues to accomplish amazing things. He openly shares his story on our campus about his clear passion for education because he witnessed firsthand collapse of the education system and the concept of open and free thought in Afghanistan. This is seen as inspiration for serving on the Board of Governors. He is committed to ensuring the future of education in his new home, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. We are honored to call him a member of our campus community and firmly believe he will strive to positively influence the future of education in Pennsylvania in a meaningful and thoughtful manner. Thank you. 
Thank you, President Patterson. Um, let me just say that that uh, the other candidates that were recommended were all easily qualified, uh, and that this was probably one of the more conflicting, I guess you could say, uh, decisions from the committee's perspective to to, to actually pick one uh, one student over the other. They were all really, really, really good quality students. Um, there's a unique uh, characteristic that Cena brings to the to the to, to this role that probably made it head and shoulders above. When you say Abby, I mean you were you were part of that conversation. All right. Um, at this juncture, I would like to have a motion that the committee recommends the appointment of Ali Cena Sharifi of Shippensburg University as a member of the board in accordance with the state systems enabling legislation as amended. May I have a motion to that effect? So moved. So moved. Abby, thank you, and Mr. Mazur, second. Um, any discussion from the committee or other board members? No hands. All righty. The members of the committee, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, uh, that motion is approved and will be referred to the full board. Randy, um, it's my understanding that Cena was not able to be with us today because of class Correct. and uh, yeah. other commitments. So we will be looking forward to him joining us with the board meeting um, uh, this next summer. And you will undertake uh, orientation activities and all? Absolutely. Yep. All right. Thank you. I believe that uh, concludes our business, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman. Uh, and Vice Chair Smith, appreciate it. Um, okay, we are now going to take up committee actions that were previously discussed. Unless anyone would like to have them divided, we are going to vote on all in one motion. Uh, so let me remind everyone, uh, these actions include, um, first, the appointment of student trustees and a student uh, board of governors member, and then updates to the academic degrees policy and the program review policy. So first, let me ask if any board member wishes to divide the motion. No hands online. Okay, so hearing none for that request, is there a motion to approve today's committee actions? So moved. Second. Second. Okay, Second. is there any further discussion? No hands on the line, Madam Chair. Okay. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Are there any opposed? Okay. Hearing none, uh, the motions carry. Thank you very much. Let us now turn to policy updates. Uh, we are going to hear from our Vice Chancellor, Dr. Denise Pearson, who is bringing forward policy updates as part of our effort to review all board level policies um, through an equity lens and revise them as needed. So as she prepares to provide an overview of today's action, I wanna thank the students, faculty and staff who have been part of the policy review committee. This is uh, very important work and uh, of course, uh, fundamental to serving our population of students and ensuring their success. So let me turn to Dr. Pearson to present the action item. Awesome, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, as part of the ongoing process to formally review all board policies, the three policies presented today for consideration can be found on pages 65 through 72 of the board meeting book. The first policy is 1989-01 University Diplomas, the recommended changes fall under the standard section of the policy. The second policy is 2013-02, evaluating the chancellor. The recommended change falls under the purpose section of the policy. The third policy is 1988-03, data collection and reporting. And the recommended change falls under the responsibility section of the policy. In all three cases, the proposed changes are relatively minor, but nonetheless affirm our commitment to a mission and values-driven policy environment that supports the success of the state system 
its universities, and the students, faculty, and staff we serve. I will end my comments by again recognizing the work of the Policy Review Committee for their commitment to this work. I also want to thank my colleagues, the policy custodians, for considering the recommendations of the committee. This work could not succeed without them. That concludes my recommendations and my report, Madam Chair. Thank you, Dr. Pearson. Uh, the chair had a, something important that came up here and needs to step out. So um, I'm gonna take over this for a little while. Um, may I have a motion that the board approves the policy amendments as listed in item 12B of the board materials? So moved. So moved. Uh, Jan and seconded. Not sure quite who seconded it, but is there any discussion or questions on this? Representative Roy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. On uh, the, the first one here, policy 1989-01A uh, about regarding the diplomas. Uh, I'm not opposed to the policy. I just had a question. It says effective immediately. Graduations, you know, a couple of weeks away. It, can this be implemented by then? Are the diplomas already printed up? I had to consult. Sorry. <laughs> um, um, technically, uh, te technically, uh, most of our graduates need to finish their courses this spring and meet all the degree requirements, which takes a few weeks to certify after the actual commencement ceremonies. And then we print the diplomas. And so as such, we should be able to implement this for this spring's diplomas. Okay. Thank you. And thus, we also have the category of the Brad Roy question category. <laughs> you, you have to have that to have a fun yeah, Absolutely. <laughs> memo to self, when we do policy, we have to think about implementation. <laughs> uh, no, thank you very much. Um, no hands any hands other hands. questions or discussion? In that case, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any, aye. Opposed? any opposed? Hearing none, the motion is approved. Uh, Randy, you're going to might have to help me because I'm not exactly sure what we're doing here. Um, uh, we are turning to the next order of business, which yes. has to do with financial s sustainability. Correct. And we're going to have Molly. Is that right? Okay. Then I'll ask CFO Molly Mercer to provide an overview of item 12C regarding financial sustainability. Sure. Thank you. Cheney University is under the U.S. Department of Education's Heightened Cash Monitoring or HCM2 status which delays the university's reimbursement by the federal government for financial aid that they extend to students. Accordingly, both the Cheney University team and the system office staff regularly monitor the cash flow for Cheney to assess the timing and receipts of these HCM2 funds against the cash flow obligations. This motion provides the approval for a loan up to six million if it were to be needed. The loan is structured in accordance with our policies and procedures with appropriate covenants and repayment terms aligned with Cheney's HCM2 receipts. The board will be notified if the loan is required as we get closer to the fiscal year end. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Molly. Chancellor, did you have anything to add to this? All right. Thank you. Um, may I have a motion? that the board approves a loan for Cheney University of Pennsylvania of up to $6 million if needed with the payments, terms, and loan covenants as listed in the board materials. So I'm going to so, motion. I move approval. Dan, second. Second. Uh, Briggs, thank you. Are there any discussion or questions regarding this motion? Hearing none. Underwater version. Hello. <laughs> Hearing none. All those in favor say aye, 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 aye. Yeah, 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 yeah. Aye. 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 Is there anybody opposed? We'll just pause for anyone online. Yeah. Since we were having a little technical difficulty. Okay, no hands raised, Mr. Chair. All right. All those in favor, please say or I, wait, I did not. Yeah. You did. That. Okay, we're good then. Motion is approved. 
And the chair's back. And, and, you, and you are so glad, right? <laughs> well, we were having some fun. <laughs> yeah, you did a great job. Uh, all right. And I do apologize for that. Um, all right. Uh, next um, on our uh, agenda are our CBA uh, collective bargaining agreement ratifications. So we are going to consider for ratification um, the collective bargaining agreements with OPEIU, with uh, the faculty, and with our coaches. So uh, I'm gonna take these all um, together. Is there a motion that the board ratifies the collective bargaining agreement with the APSCUF faculty, uh, the collective bargaining agreement with APSCUF non-faculty coaches, and the collective bargaining agreement and memo of understanding with OPEIU? These are all listed in the board materials um, and this vote will authorize the chancellor and the chair to execute the appropriate documents. Is there a motion? So Thank you. Second. Second. Thank you. Is there any discussion? And I understand uh, Ryan is available. If there, ah, oh, there you are. For, if there are any questions, are there any questions or any further discussion on this? Okay. We'll see if there's any on online. I see no hands, Madam Chair. Okay. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Are there any opposed? Okay, excellent. Uh, and congratulations uh, once again uh, to Brian, uh, to, to Ken, to everybody uh, on all of these negotiating teams um, for, uh, for the excellent work. And we look forward to working with all of you. Our last item for the day uh, is on the non-represented uh, uh, pool, merit pool. And uh, so let me move that the board authorizes the creation of merit pools for not non-represented employees as outlined in board item 12E. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Is there any discussion? Randy, you'll be available if there are any questions, right? Yeah. No okay. hands online, Madam Chair. Any discussion or questions about the merit pool? Okay, then all in favor, please say aye. 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 Are there any opposed? Okay, that motion passes as well. Thank you very much. Uh, and to close us out then for the record, I wanna report that the board met in executive session yesterday from one to 2 p.m. to discuss personnel matters and from 3.26 p.m. until 5 p.m to discuss contractual matters. Before we adjourn, uh, let me ask if there's any other business to come before the board. Madam Chair, if I may. Yes, please. You're gonna have to give me a, a line item at this point because I always seem to have something to share. Um, I just wanted to pick up on um, the chancellor's comments regarding investment. And I just wanna personify um, the investment that the system has made, not only in me, but my family as well. As some of you may know, I began at Shippensburg University as an Act 101 student. So that is the commitment that the Commonwealth has made to low-income students to give them access to public higher education through funding. And on day one of Act 101, I met my best friend to this very day. And through Shippensburg, I also met the person that I eventually married. All of us are first generation students. My husband is a first generation college, or excuse me, high school student as well. When Chancellor Greenstein said about the opportunities for low income students to move into middle class, we are an embodiment of that, both my best friend, my husband and I. We are before you 30 years now later, if I can really imagine my 1994 self and thinking about whether or not I would be sitting around this table with you all, never could I have ever imagined that. I have had opportunities that my parents and my grandparents could only imagine were possible for someone in our family. And it is not just our story. It is the story of many other graduates of the PASHI system. But it also, and President Hannah and I have talked about this, it has given permission for others in our family to seek out higher education, especially those of our family members that come from rural parts of Pennsylvania. 
that may not see themselves as having the ability to go to college. We now have, um, my husband and I now have cousins who graduated also from Shippensburg who are now serving in the US Air Force. We have cousins who are graduates of Lock Haven, former university, who are now serving as physicians assistants serving rural health care needs. We have multiple cousins who are teachers teaching in special education, tech education, and other forms of education. We are products of the PASHI system, and this system gives opportunity that we cannot just know from data points. It's the real stories of people that are out there across our Commonwealth who the system has really made a difference. And I just wanted to share that with you all because I wouldn't be here without the investment that both PASHI and Shippensburg and now Westchester has made in me in my professional and personal endeavors. Thank you for that opportunity. That is fantastic. And you are definitely getting a line item in the agenda going forward, as long as it remains that inspirational every time. It's a high bar. She can she can meet it. She can meet it. Okay. Uh, all right. Once again, any other business? Any other further business? I don't know, because you look like you want to say something. No. Okay, fine. <laughs> Sorry. You did. You did. Okay. All right. Then hearing none, our meeting is adjourned. Thank you all very, very much.